Thank you so much, Aya. Okay, so once again, I'd like to uh, greet everyone a happy Sabbath. Um, I praise God for bringing us all together here. Um, to be honest, uh, if it wasn't for him, I wouldn't be here right now because I'm actually based all the way in the Philippines. Um, but as you can see, I made it in one piece. Still a little jet lagged, but very, very blessed to be able to share the entire Sabbath with um, my brethren here in um, California. So uh, there's so many things that I could share with you, but for today, um, I'd like to give you just a little background on my spiritual journey, how I became an Adventist, and um, how this changed my life, as well as um, a little health message um, in the form of a, a visual presentation, which we'll talk about after. Um, because that's also very, very dear to me, the health message. Okay, so as um, Sister Gladys mentioned earlier, um, my, my father's German, my mom's Filipina, specifically Ilonga. Do we have any Ilongos in the house of the Lord? Oh, my own Adlaus in you. Um, I, I love speaking Ilongo. My mom used to talk to us in Ilongo when we were young, especially when we were naughty. <laughs> so that was quite often. But... Um, yeah, I, I, I'm really a, a big fan of, you know, um, languages as well. I, uh, I speak five fluently and I studied two more in college um, after that. So the ones I speak are English, German, French, Tagalog, and Ilongo. And then I also studied Spanish and Italian. As they say, if you don't use it, you lose it. So I'm always open to practicing my Spanish and Italian with anyone out there. But um, the reason I mention this is also because knowing so many languages and cultivating this talent of mine was very beneficial in making more friends, um, communicating with people, even about the Lord. So if you're as passionate about languages as I am, maybe even for the young ones, that's always a good choice to um, continue learning languages, especially in your extracurricular courses. So. Um, thanks to my parents, I was also able to travel quite a bit. Um, I was born in Taiwan, and then I lived in Germany for about four years, uh, and then I moved back to Manila, where I spent most of my life. Um, so elementary and high school was in Manila, and then I did a bit of modeling in Asia, um, only to just you know, to decide what I'm going to take up in college, because uh, I really wasn't sure yet. I mean, I've always liked fashion design, but my family was telling me that that's more of um, a passion rather than like a profession. So, um, you know, trying to consider their counsel, eventually um, I ended up studying nursing in New York. Uh, I come from a family of nurses, actually. So I have two aunts, they're both RNs and... Um, one of them is even a head nurse at Bellevue Hospital in New York. So uh, they, they encouraged me to uh, do nursing. And they always told me, you had such a big heart for people, so you should do this. And um, you can always go to fashion design after. And I, I thought, that sounds like a good deal. <laughs> you know, just make sure my family's happy first and then get to do what I want after. <laughs> um, up to this day, I never really practiced nursing. I, I mean, I got my license, and um, I could uh, technically practice any time. But um, as uh, mentioned earlier, um, I went back to my first passion or love, which is um, fa fashion design. Um, but all in, in God's time and in, in, um, in his perfect way. So um, as I mentioned, I lived in Germany, I lived in New York and the Philippines. But it was a, a very interesting journey for my family on how we became um, especially attracted to the Adventist faith because when I was actually born in Taipei, Taiwan, um, my mom, she had a lot of Adventist friends there who invited her to service on Sabbath and she'd already been seeking for the truth and she'd attend all different types of denominations from the Mormons to Iglesia Ni Cristo to Jehovah's Witnesses, like she really searched um, the way we ought to if we want to seek for Jesus. And it was when she entered, um, you know, the house of God um, in Taiwan, um, you know, among Adventists that uh, 
it was very different. First and foremost, uh, she, she was surprised that there were no graven images. It was just fresh flowers at the front and um, everyone was very simple and very kind. And um, she was also impressed with um, the food that was being served, which was all vegetarian. And uh, I, I believe according to her, when the choir started to sing without any instrumentals, no drums whatsoever, just you know, pure vo vocals, um, she felt like electricity go through her body, she always says. Uh, it was just like so pure and heavenly. I think the closest that she could, could find to, to something, you know, heavenly. And um, I think she cried the first time she went, um, you know, to service. And that's kind of how it jump-started in my mom, um, you know, her curiosity for the Adventist faith. And, you know, a few months later, uh, I was born in an Adventist hospital, Seventh-day Adventist hospital there, and so was my, my brother next to me, um, Stefan. So uh, the doctor that delivered me was American, but he was Adventist. I think he, he's also from um, California. And so my mom just got more and more exposed to, to Adventist practices and the light that, that we uh, carry. And it's really interesting because after Taiwan, we were relocated to different um, places, but we'd always come across Adventists and they were consistently amazing in the way they lived their lives and um, the way they cared for my, my mom and my family. Everyone was just really helpful and open. Um, open to sharing and welcoming us. So at, uh, once we went back to the Philippines, after Germany in particular, and at around the age of 15, uh, one of the designers, fashion designers in the Philippines, invited us to Bible study, because at that time I'd already been modeling, and he he had a really interesting study. That's also when I met Aya, who sang for us and her family um, for the first time. And I, I was really, really taken away by the, the subjects that we had discussed. So from the health message to prophecy, especially Daniel and Revelation, that really captured me and it all made so much sense to me. So I decided that we have to continue the Bible study Imagine I was 15, but I was just so amazed. Um, and I, I wanted to become vegetarian right away on the spot. I, I saw the benefits, and I wasn't really such a big meat eater to begin with. I mean, there's a couple of dishes that I appreciated that were meaty, and you know, coming from a German background, it kind of makes sense. But um, overall, I really, um, I really wanted to switch my diet um, almost instantly. And that's what I did. I, I told my mom, let's all go vegetarian, let's do it together so we're more encouraged. And we, we did, and after two weeks, um, I usually uh, have to admit that I was craving a McDonald's cheeseburger. I don't ask me why, but I just had to have it one last time. <laughs> and that's what I did. I ran to McDonald's, I had two actually, and then I decided that was it, that's the end of meat. I, I got my fix, and uh, I'm, I'm going full force um, with this new diet. And up to this day, it's been 17 years. I'm 32 now. Um, it's been 17 years since I'm vegetarian, and I'm very, very happy with this decision. And I always try to level up in my diet. So every time I learn something new about health or about what we should avoid, um, I try to apply it to my diet. I don't feel... Like, I need to stay stuck at a certain level. If, if there's something out there that's harmful to my body, my temple, the gift that God gave me, I want to know about it, and I want to make sure I don't allow that to enter my body. So that's the mindset I've developed, and I can encourage you to also do. Protect yourselves, even from the foods that we, um, you eat and the beverage that you eat, because anything that tastes um, too good is usually deceptive. And if you go back to the book of Genesis, right, um, the devil is really wise. He tempted Eve in the form of um, food. So food was the medium, of course, in the form of a fruit, but this is also symbolical that food will be used as a medium for us to you know, destroy our bodies at some point. And in our generation, it's through all these unhealthful types of foods that, you know, we, we are offered. Um, a lot of processed foods, a lot of genetically modified foods. Um, and, you know, coming from a nursing background, I, I also have um, been exposed to more information about these things, and I'm still vegetarian today because 
it's just um, safer and wiser to do so. So um, if you want to be effective as um, you know, a follower of Christ, you have to take good care of yourself, this gift, this body that we have. Okay, so um, I became vegetarian at 15, and um, we continued the Bible study, and eventually I had to go to college in New York, and what's really amazing is that we immediately found a church in New York. In fact, that's one of the, the best parts about being a Seventh-day Adventist. You can find Adventists all over the world, right? So I, I immediately felt at home. In fact, I was so lucky because New York City is really expensive. But um, thanks to a lady at church, she allowed me to stay with her and rent um, one room, but she's a really nice um, apartment. And everything else was shared. So I had my own room, and then we shared the kitchen, the bathroom, and I paid $500 a month. And I lived in Manhattan, so that's a really good deal for New York City because nowadays you can't find anything lower than 1800 a month. So I was very, very blessed. And at the same time, we could go to church together. We could talk about God. So you can really see, like in retrospect, how God would always lead me to the, these amazing people that all happen to be Adventist. And at some point in 2008, um, after pretty much practicing the, the, the Adventist faith for about 10 years, uh, the pastor in New York told, you know, approached me and he told me, Sandra, you know what, you would be a great candidate for baptism. You should really consider it and pray for it. And I told him, I don't know, I don't know if I'm ready, you know, because I, I, I always had this, this vision that you have to be perfect, you know, to walk with God. It's like you can't, you don't want to be flawed anymore, you know, and you don't want to start on the, on the wrong um, side or the wrong foot. So um, I, I was always a bit um, hesitant. And then he explained to me, especially this might be good for you as well, for those who are encouraging um, or encouraged to get baptized. Um, he was telling me, we'll never ever be 100% perfect. That's the goal that we should always strive for. But baptism is about publicly declaring that you walk, want to walk with God in your life and you want to be associated with God, right? And especially the light that you've received from the Seventh-day Adventist faith. So... That being said, it made sense to me, and I told my mom about it, and it was really funny because I said, Mom, I think I'm going to get baptized. I think it's time. You know, 10 years of observing the Sabbath and, you know, the health message and other, other beautiful practices. Um, she said, wait, you're going to get baptized? Me too. <laughs> wait, I'm the mom. I should go first, you know. <laughs> and I told her, well, it's, it's really... Um, up to you like if you feel like it's right then you know you want to go for it yeah then let's do it together and and that's what we did we got baptized together she's so cute she even said I have to go first okay I'm the adult and I was like okay <laughs> no worries so that's what happened we got uh, baptized um, uh, in 2008 in New York and then I pretty much wrapped up my my nursing studies and uh, had to go back to the Philippines for a while and when I was there um, I had been immediately approached by, you know, Filipino scouts that I should join a pageant. And, of course, I was just kind of, um, you know, fresh into my baptism. But at the same time, um, I, I was still kind of open to this idea of maybe sharing what I know when I join a beauty pageant. So the temptations were still there. And... Um, you know, I, I think that this this dream that my family had for me because of, I guess, the, the potential, the height, the, the beauty, etc., to be a representative of the Philippines would really would be suitable for me. I thought I'd give it a try. And, um, yeah, lo and behold, I ended up, um, you know, winning Miss Philippines Earth first. So this is a pageant that focuses on the environment. And I really like the advocacy because the moment you win, you get to do environmental projects and highlight, um, you know, Mother Earth and how to protect and preserve her. And I thought this is a gift from God. You know, it is in nature that you would come closest to the Lord and are reminded of him. So maybe I can connect the two, you know, my faith and, you know, being part of um, a pageant or be being a beauty queen. Um, and that's what I also tried to do. Um, once I won, we went to different schools, especially public schools. So you have young kids sitting in front of you, and we would sing with them songs about the environment, and then we teach them 10 tips to go green. So instead of the 10 commandments, we teach them 10 ways to go green, what they can apply in their everyday life um, with regards to you know preserving the environment. So it was, it was really nice. I, I, I was thankful, and I also highlighted how um, you know the Lord 
you know, created the, in, the environment, nature as a gift for us to, to always remember him. So that's, that's, that was kind of nice. And then I also represented the Philippines as a consequence in the international finals where I placed first runner up, which is Miss Earth Air. Um, Philippines won the year before that, so it was kind of hard for me to win again. Plus it was hosted in the Philippines and I won all special awards, but considering we were 80, 86 candidates, you know, first runner up, I was, I was happy with that title. And, um, I, I think all things work together for good because even if I got baptized before I joined the pageant, at the end of the day, when I when I finally reached the age of 30, um, when I really wanted to go back to my faith seriously, um, it almost worked for me in my ministry that I, you know, I was Miss Earth at one point because uh, a lot of people, especially in the Philippines, they, you know, I think I guess. Over time, you you sometimes tend to get bored or wary. You know, um, you want like some action in your life, or you you know you need to you need to jumpstart your faith again. And when they saw that some, someone like me, you know, dedicating time for for the Lord, just in my own personal way, I really wanted to be active in the ministry. A lot of Filipinos were encouraged, especially the young women. So they, they, you know, they would say, if she can do it, if she, um, you know, Miss Earth has time for the Lord, why can't I have time for the Lord? So that was like the immediate consequence of my ministry. And then I started to get involved um, in um, one, one message, or not really involved, but I, I started to pay more attention um, to how to dress for Sabbath, because of course, being a former beauty queen, we always had to look perfect from head to toe. It was all about the hair, the makeup, the heels, and uh, all, all the, the glitz and glam, um, the outward adorning. But uh, when I studied the Bible more, I realized that God doesn't care about any of that. He doesn't care about physical beauty and attraction. He cares about the inner beauty, the beauty of our hearts and how our characters are. So when, when I um, read more about this concept, especially in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, beautiful um, scripture reading, um, God describes how um, you know, women should dress in modest adorning and focus on godly works and um, practice shamefacedness and sobriety. So uh, you know, when I really fully understood this, this concept, um, I decided to change my ways and my attires and um, it was hard because most of my wardrobe was different from how I ought to dress, um, you know, in the house of the Lord. But um, I realized, you know, we're worshiping an amazing God. He deserves all the honor and respect, even in the way we dress. So technically, Adventists, you know, we, we claim that we are the people of God. Amen. We, according to um, Ellen White, uh, the greatest truth ever given to mankind, especially in this generation, is to the Adventist people. So the light is with us, and we consider ourselves peculiar or different from the world, right? Because, you know, those who are with Christ are not of the world. So even in the form of dress, we should stand out in a way that, from afar, you could already tell that that person does not dress in a worldly manner. So this entire, um, you know, notion started to make more sense to me, and I wanted to dress appropriately on Sabbath first, and then later the rest of the week. So I tried to shop for, you know, modest clothing, only to find out that there weren't really that many options. If I did find a longer skirt, there'd be a slit somewhere, or if it's a long sleeve top, there'd be a plunging neckline, or the back would be exposed. So it was really hard to find um, appropriate clothing. So in the end, what I did was I decided to design my own Sabbath dresses. And, um, you know, I started with just one seamstress and I would make my own dress for Sabbath. And um, since I got to, to share my testimony um, in different churches, the feedback was really positive and women wanted to buy what I was wearing. And I told them, Thank you. I'm glad you appreciate the design because even if you know it's modest, it's still stylish, and you know the feedback was good. So um, the only problem is I I have one seamstress and she's just a part-time seamstress, so I I can't really reproduce more of of my designs at this point. But we can pray for it, and hopefully in God's time it would be possible that I could um, do this you know full force alongside my, my ministry on modesty and, and dress and character. So 
Um, that's kind of what happened. Fast forward a year and a half later, um, which is this year, I met um, the right seamstress who had time, who loved my vision, and because of one woman, um, I was able to start my clothing line last July, end of July, and it's online right now, but it's called Suravilla, which is actually my mom's maiden name before she got married to my dad. And um, yeah, I named it after her because she was the first woman to teach me how to dress modestly. So uh, that being said, um, you know, my life changed in so many ways. So from keeping the Sabbath from sunset to sunset to refusing projects that would offer like really good money, modeling jobs, hosting jobs on Sabbath. I would let all of those go because I knew it wasn't something from God if it falls on the Sabbath. So I, I stopped, um, you know, entertaining work opportunities on Sabbath. Um, I became vegetarian. I changed my wardrobe and I'm ready to do more <laughs> for the Lord as, you know, so um, I really believe that we should constantly transform, you know, in a, of course, in a genuine manner. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that despite, uh, you know, the, dis the temptations and the discouragements that come with all this um, intention and um, that I, I'm still enthusiastic enough to continue, you know, uh, transforming into the image that God wants us to become. And um, yeah, I'm just, I'm just so blessed and so happy. It's just a different kind of happiness. It's that happiness that um, you know can only come from God you know, to really do His will and obey His His laws and commandments. So um, that being said, you know, like here I am today. I mean, actually, I'm I'm wearing um, part of my designs and. Uh, for those of you, especially the ladies who are interested to know more about uh, my ministry on modesty in dress, uh, tomorrow we'll be having uh, a ladies' tea party. Um, I believe it's at 2 p.m. at White Memorial, and it would be great if you could join us there. I'll talk more about um, modesty in dress and character as well as the collection there. And um, yeah, there's also, uh, actually, I think it's just for the women tomorrow, but uh, for the men, I also share a little bit what, what they should um, do when, when they come to church, how they should be dressing. But since, you know, I, uh, tomorrow you might not be there, for the gentlemen, I might as well share it now that it's, it's just important for men. It's always easier for men but to just always look clean, neat, and tidy. Uh, make sure that uh, even your, 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 your teeth are brushed and your hair is combed and your fingernails are clean and your shoes are polished. So uh, these are specific um, parts that Mrs. White actually highlighted so that when you greet the ladies on Sabbath with that beautiful smile and you shake them with that clean hand <laughs> from head to toe, you look dashing and appropriate. So when it comes to the gentlemen, it's more about cleanliness. And um, with regards to um, the women, of course, I don't want to give too much away, but like the length of, of our skirts or dresses needs to be emphasized, so anything above the knee should be avoided, and then less showing of skin is actually better, right? So th th these are just a few giveaways I wanted to share today. But yeah, that's pretty much um, my, my journey in a nutshell, a big nutshell. <laughs> but uh, for, for this uh, late afternoon, early evening, I'd i uh, love to share a little bit more about the healthful living message that I have with you. Some of you might be familiar with um, these facts, but for those of you who aren't, you might be shocked. This is all based on um, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 to 20, uh, which talks about our bodies being um, a living temple of the Holy Ghost. So our bodies were bought with a price. Uh, someone died for you and for me and this life is technically borrowed and the least we can do is take care of this life and you know may give justice to, to the sacrifice that Jesus made for us on the cross by taking good care of ourselves and, and doing his work finishing his work here on earth with him okay do you recognize that person <laughs> That was actually a photo of me during um, 2009. Um, we did a lot of um, organic farming outreach, and uh, this was in, in my province in Bacola, Necros Occidental, for those of you who are my Kababayans. Okay, so what's amazing also about uh, 
our, our faith and the Adventist truth is that we have the health message and we have the eight laws of health, right? I'm sure most of you have heard about them. Um, now they have the acronym New Start, but originally it used to be God's plan. And each letter stands for one of those eight health laws. So I'll quickly go through them just so you have an idea. G is for godly trust. O is for open air. D is for daily exercise. S is for sunlight. P for proper rest. L for lots of water. A for always temperate and N for nutrition. So all of these are of equal importance and they all deserve um, their respective lecture, you could almost say, uh, because there's so much you could talk about per topic. But for today, I'll be focusing more on nutrition because um, I think that that's something that we have to, f you know, really, uh, we can consciously make a decision on instantly, like pretty much over our next meal on what we want to nourish our bodies with. Um, this is a lecture that comes in Tagalog and, and English, but I'll translate this for you. And in Tagalog, it says, Isa sa pinakamalakas na tukso ng haharapin ng tao ay ang punto ng pagkain, uh, which technically means one of the biggest uh, temptations that you know humanity or mankind will ever face is you know food, food consumption. All right, so these are traditional Filipino dishes. Um, I'm sure you would like them too, but this one is called, it's chicken, yes, um, it's a chicken dish, it's called tinola, so it has a very distinct uh, flavor, and uh, it, you know, it's ginger-based, and there's like some papaya in there, I believe, if not mistaken. It's really good for those of you, of, of you who've ever tried it, you'll agree with me. Um, What's this? Bulalo, yes, this is um, a traditional pork dish often. So it's a soup, but it comes with like um, greens, potato, and then you usually often see the bones of the meat in the soup as well. My dog would love that. <laughs> We, we have 7,107 islands in the Philippines. We're an island country, and we have so much access to fresh seafood and um, a lot of fish. So tilapia, this, this, is, this fish is called tilapia, is one of our you know, popular fish dishes. Just throw it on the grill, and it's good to go. So these are all some really tasty foods that we appreciate. Now, um, there's an interesting study by Reader's Digest that reveals that overeating now kills more people globally than starvation. So more people are dying from overeating or eating too much food versus starving or not having enough food, which is really ironic. Um, when I show these photos to Filipinos, they just crack up because, well, we don't have too many obese people in the Philippines yet but I'm sure we'll get there if they continue to eat the way they do. Um, so, you know, th this is how, um, you know, women nowadays embrace their bodies and their diets, you know, so they're actually really happy. Um, but I don't, th I don't honestly want to look like that, and I'm sure you don't either, and that's not how God designed for us to look. Um, so what do we see here? <laughs> no, there's no brand, <laughs> but um, yeah, you're right, you're on the right track, it's soda, right? Um, soda deserves like its own study, but soda, when does soda taste best? When it's warm, hot, or cold? <laughs> cold, that's right. Do you know that soda tastes best when it's cold because there's so much sugar in soda that when it's, you know, when we drink it cold with ice, our taste buds are pretty much slightly numbed, so the sweetness is perfect, because if it was warm, it would be too sweet. So there's this whole science between how sodas are created, and um, yeah, in, in one, one whole liter, you have like 16 teaspoons of sugar um, in there. So imagine, you know, like, that's like calling for diabetes just by drinking soda. And there are new studies now that also reveal that it's very acidic. Soda is so powerful that you could even clean like rust and toilets. That's how acidic soda is. But we all love it because, 
you know, the devil knows how to tempt us and what's good for the taste, to be blunt about it, but it's so harmful um, to our bodies. In fact, it contains phosphoric acid, and um, phosphoric acid is actually also found in um, cleaners, you know, household cleaning products, which removes grout and mortar residue, hard water deposits, and rust, as I mentioned. So, phosphoric acid um, is, is a really powerful and, and dangerous ingredient. It is used in shipyards to remove rust from aircraft carriers and transport ships, ships acid. Um, it is also used in fertilizers and detergents, including industrial cleaners. In fact, it has a pH level that is equivalent to um, the acid of batteries, so it's a very acidic um, beverage. And listen to this, um, the effect of sodas long-term starts in our mouth, actually, in our, because phosphoric acid in sodas nearly is as damaging to teeth as battery acid. So over time, our teeth start to discolor and um, start to weaken because the acid just starts to eat up um, our teeth. Now, what's another part of the body that is pretty much similar to our teeth? That's right, I heard, that I heard bones. Our skeletal system um, is, is of the same um, structure right? and um, content. So consuming highly acidic substances is not only bad for your teeth, but also terrible for bone health and can promote a deterioration of the jawbone, so our jawbone, um, our chin also, pelvis and femur. Essentially drinking phosphoric acid dissolves away your skeletal system. So imagine these kids here, especially here in America, start drinking sodas so young, and then they grow up drinking sodas into college, into into you know the, to their work life and married life, and suddenly they just realize they have weak bones and osteoporosis, and they don't know why. So, so here's one of the reasons that um, that they could have developed this over a long term period. Just to show you how that looks visually, on the left you have healthy bone density and on the right you have bone density that already has so much space and holes because the acid ate it up. So you can really see it um, under these x-rays. For the men, pay attention. According to Reuters, drinking too much cola could lower men's sperm count. So there's even an effect on uh, the men's retro reproductive system when it comes to um, drinking soda. And that's something you might want to research on your own as well. <laughs> okay, another thing that we should uh, be conscious about, I'll, I'll talk about different products, so just like a crash course, and you can go home and do your, your individual research, is um, what's out in the market now, especially found in sweeteners, even in... in um, sodas, particularly uh, diet sodas, is aspartame. So you may not have heard of it, you may have heard of it, um, but essentially it's often found in diet sodas. And there's this lady, her name is Victoria Ines Brown, and she did a study on aspartame by serving it to um, these rats in laboratories, and you can see that over time, they all developed tumors. So this one had one, you know, in, in the front of its body. Here's another one that pretty much grew the size of its own body. So it had like a twin tumor, but all because of the aspartame experiment. And they pretty much started to deform these, these um, poor animals. And yeah, they just became really injured and abnormal, and that's all because of the aspartame. So the sweetener is found in over 6,000 consumables. Take note, this includes chocolates, ice creams, sodas, candies, coffees, pharmaceuticals, vitamins, and dairy products. Um, so in some form um, or amount, um, you know, there, there is some aspartame. In the moment that's there, suddenly one day we'll wake up at 30 or 40 and we have a tumor and we don't know why. You know, we blame it on our parents, our forefathers, but really it, it was all part of what we were consuming um, to begin with. So all the good stuff nowadays, if it's too good, it tastes too yummy, it's probably because of the, these type of ingredients and they're so damaging to our health. Okay, another dangerous but 
tasty type of food is. <laughs> Who does not like pizza in here? Raise your hand. Okay. Really? Wow. Okay, so like two people. Okay. Um, but here's a follow-up question. What makes pizza takes, taste extra good? <laughs> that's right. All that cheese. In fact, that's like one of my weaknesses. I always say I'm a customized vegetarian because I may have given up all these types of foods, but I'm still stuck on cheese. You know, I think that's my European um, heritage in me, but I love cheese. In fact, I can, you could blindfold me and I could probably name different cheeses. That's how, how much I love it when I, you know, when I taste it. But um, cheese is grosser than you thought. So here's a... Um, a revelation from MSNBC, so it's a pretty um, legit uh, source. The de network documents the truly horrifying levels of bacteria, stomach lining pesticides, and pure fat that comes with every pus filled slice of cheese. So essentially, we all know that, you know, cheese is pure bacteria and it can be compared to pus because something needs to deteriorate um, in order for it to eventually, you know, turn into this form or this type of um, f a way that it is. And factories are adding more bacterial groups into cheese to achieve enhanced flavors. So um, it's ironic because the, the smellier cheese is, like the grosser it smells, the better it tastes for you know cheese lovers, especially those you know who are familiar with the European cheeses. I mean, I, 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 but I don't go as far as like, you know, eating the cheeses where you even see the worms, you know, like there, it gets to, it gets to that level. And that's like a delicacy, I think, in France. So it's so twisted because it's technically like pure bacteria that you're injecting into um, your, your healthy body. Um, so again, you know, going back to how it's similar or likened to pus. Yeah, this is the, the type of pus that we're talking about. So cheese is kind of at the same level with regards to, you know, bacteria because pus is also pure bacteria. Okay. This is really popular in the Philippines, but we have this in the American version, chips, right? Chips are like, you know, everyone loves chips, um, even the kids, but these are also very dangerous. In fact, they contain according to CNN Health, MSG. Have you heard of MSG? S stands, yes, bet betchen, and um, it stands for monosodium glutamate. Um, now, it's really dangerous, this component. It's also used a lot of times in Chinese food, and if you, if you notice, um, if you eat in a restaurant and you feel drowsy, really drowsy after and tired, um, that you actually notice yourself that you're way too tired, it's probably because there's a lot of MSG in the food. And this uh, ingredient is very dangerous for our brain. Our, it's a neurotoxin. Neuro meaning brain, toxin, of course, being a poison. So a substance that actually induces nerve changes and possible nerve damage. So we need our nerves to be healthy, for the impulses to function, our body, our, our motor, motor system to you know, work efficiently, our movement, and that all happens through neurotransmitting, and this is, this is what harms that and interrupts that MSG. So it's found in chips and, um, of course, a lot of other foods. In fact, um, it's so tricky because there are about 20 different types of names now in the market that all pretty much are the same as MSG. So you should research these um, other variations that pretty much have the same effect on the body. Um, because, you, you know, a label may not read MSG, but it may read something else that is the same as MSG. So we should really be aware of this. And they also did a study on, on MSG with um, the, the lab rats, and they would really find, you know, next to a healthy rat, that um, these rats are turning abnormal as they consume them. Um, MSG is a substance added to foods and beverages that literally stimulates neurons to death, causing brain damage of varying degrees. In fact, I think we, uh, there's, there's a book that you guys can um, uh, read. It's by Russell L. Blaylock. He's a doctor, and he focused specifically on these excitotoxins, the taste that kills. So there are foods that are so good, but they actually kill us. That's how how bad it's gotten, and we should really be aware of these foods so we can avoid them. 
You can see here um, on a scan how a normal brain looks and then how it would look when MSG is consumed. So you see like a lot of um, white blank spots already. So it's a lot of damage there. Just you'll see lesions basically. Anything that tastes good, all of the fast food flavored chips, most of the condiments, most salad dressings. Imagine you're already eating salad, you're eating raw foods, but then your dressing is actually so dangerous <laughs> because it's processed. Um, most processed lunch meats, most sausages, soups of the grocery, off the grocery shelf um, are likely to contain MSG. So sorry to burst your bubble, sorry to tell you this, but uh, you know, it's, it's really important to, to be aware and you know, this, this is something we shouldn't ignore um, and we should definitely share with others as well. Okay. So moving forward, uh, so we've talked about uh, different types of food. We talked about sodas, about cheese, about um, MSG, aspartame. Now I want to talk to you briefly about um, this doctor who created a study on the number of bacteria um, in foods, especially in meat. His name is Dr. C.E. Roderick, a, a bacteriologist of Battle Creek Sanitarium and Hospital, and he conducted a study of bacteria in meat. He actually loved meat. So um, he wanted to know, he was just curious how much bacteria was found in meat. So he started by measuring the bacteria in a slice of steak. Any guesses how much bacteria is found in steak? Like, let's say, a, a decent slice of steak? <laughs> Who says 1,000? Okay. Uh, 10,000, 100,000, more than 100,000, <laughs> okay, all right, so the final number of bacteria for a slice of steak is 1.5 million bacteria, yeah, and that's just like, let's say, a hand, a hand um, amount that's the size of your hand, so that's a lot of bacteria just in, be in a st slice of steak. How about oyster juice? Who, who thinks that it has more bacteria? Who thinks it has less bacteria? <laughs> Everyone's like, no, more, more. <laughs> okay, how much more? <laughs> this is a numbers game, okay? Uh, okay, so the answer for oyster juice is 3.4 million bacteria per count. So a little more than double of steak. How about cheese, which is technically pure bacteria? <laughs> how many how many bacterial counts do you think does cheese have? Okay, goodbye pizza. Goodbye <laughs> pizza. <laughs> it's like it's, um, but yeah, cheese has 18 million bacteria per count, so definitely another level of bacteria. Okay, fresh goat dropping, so fresh goat poop. Let's compare this, uh, the bacterial count of food to the bacterial count of, let's say, the dropping of, of animals. Which has more? F like the food that we just mentioned, let's say cheese, or fresh goat dropping. <laughs> you guys seem to know all the information already, so you, you must not be eating cheese anymore. <laughs> okay, the answer is 20 million bacteria per count. So we said cheese had how much? Oh, very good, you're on track. 18 versus 20 million, that's pretty close. So if you're eating you know, cheese, you could be eating fresh goat drop it, dropping and you'll get the same amount of bacteria in your body. Of course, it's a different taste and smell. <laughs> How about fresh horse dropping? More or less than goat dropping? More? See? 25 million. Okay. But, it, you know, it's interesting and good for us to see, like, what the range of bacteria is in, in the dropping of these animals. So we can compare it also to food. We need some sort of comparison. Okay, now let's go back to corned beef. This is something that, like, Filipinos love, and I'm sure, you know, you, 
Americans too. More or less than goat and horse dropping. More, let's see how much more. 31 million, oh boy. So this has more than cheese and more than the, the dropping. So to horse and goat, 20, 20, 25, this is 31 million. Uh-oh, hamburgers. I could be playing a trick on you, it might be less. <laughs> How many millions for, for a hamburger? 40, so we already had 30, right? 75 million bacteria in a hamburger. Definitely not from the veggies, so don't ask me from here. But it's, it has cheese and it has the meat, right? So a lot of bacteria in, in both those alone. Okay, how about pork? We're almost done, by the way. Can I hear 80 million, 90 million? <laughs> going once, going twice. 95 million bacteria in pork. So pork still beats the list so far. And chicken, everyone's favorite. Okay, so no, we won't talk about the bacterial count of chicken. But what we will talk about, it's, it's, it's less than the others, I'm sure, but not much less. But what, the reason I'm showing you a photo of chicken, which many people love, is because uh, there is some uh, you know, shocking information regarding chicken. I don't know about the U.S. per se right now. I could look into it. But in the Philippines, you can grow chicken in you know, less than 30 days now. That's how quick you, you can grow them. Um, so before, you used to have a 70-day uh, process to grow chicken. Now they reduce it to 48 in this image. So that's 1950 versus 2008. And of course, in 2016, it's less than 30 days. So which chicken is healthier, 70 days or 48 days? Yeah, even if the, the one on the right looks chubbier and fatter and, you know, uh, the, the slimmer one is actually healthier, right? And how about among the fish? Which fish is um, better? Which size of fish is healthier? Smaller one, that's right. Um, so with regards to chicken in particular, the reason they can grow them so fast is because they inject these um, animals with hormones exactly and um, these hormones are actually really dangerous for us so you know the, and also for the animals I mean they don't have a normal life anymore they pretty much just are you know loaded with these hormones and um, ready to be served to us but um, in Tagalog and I'm going to translate it for you um, essentially what what it says is that they contain 2,700 different types of medicines um, that are injected into the chicken to, f you know, fast track their growth. So that includes tranquilizers, hormones, antibiotics. All of that is um, pretty much injected to these chicken. And um, yeah, it's it's really sad because we think that the moment you cook the chicken, you know, it's like, you know, perfectly fine. But you know, th these. Um, are consumed by us, these chicken, and we also consume all the hormones and everything that was injected to them, and it has certain effects on us. Precisely, this is so interesting, it's more intense in Tagalog, but um, the, the chicken that we consume is high in a certain type of hormone. Can you guess which female hormone that is? Estrogen. Estrogen is um, something that they inject in the chicken. Um, it's a female hormone. It actually um, increases the size of, of women's breasts. And of course, that's one of the tastiest part of the chicken, right? The breast, chicken breast. So they get a lot of estrogen injected. In fact, there's, there's um, this quote here by Evo Morales, who's a Bolivian president. Um, and he said that because there's so much female hormone injected to the chicken, he won't be surprised if there are more and more gays in the world today be simply because of what they eat. So he was bold enough to make that statement that um, the way they feel about their gender is actually related to what they eat. So it's, it's a whole another thought process, but I mean, you can see the connection, right? Or the effect, at least, of the hormones that are injected to... to um, 
the, these animals for us to consume. Now, again, going back to the Bible, I know this is some pretty intense stuff, but um, I'm pretty much done. You can, you can exhale now. Um, what we must understand is that you know, our bodies are a living temple, again, as it says in 1 Corinthians 6, 19 to 20. So your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own. For you are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So, you know, these are just a few facts that I mention, and they just touch the surface of different types of foods that exist in our generation and time that are harmful to our bodies. But, um, you know, the exposure to knowledge is the first step, and then what you do with that knowledge is really up to you. Do you want to apply it? Do you want to research further? And then really optimize your life and your health. Um, that is up to you. I can only encourage you to do so. Everything is a struggle and there will be cheat days and whatnot, but I think it's really important that we try to protect our minds, bodies, and souls to the best ability, especially considering that um, we are living in the last days and Jesus is so near to coming back. Um, I'm excited. I'm also a bit scared um, just because you know, he, he's waiting for us. Like, we always say that we're waiting for him, but he's waiting for us to, to be ready so that he can finally take us home. But, um, you know, according to prophecy, there's a few more ex events that need to take place, and we need to be watchful, we need to be equipped, even in terms of our health. And uh, one thing that I also admire about, um, you know, being an Adventist is the health message. In fact, um, the health message is going to be the right arm of the gospel in the last days. So we will be able to help a lot of people and bring a lot of souls to Christ because of the health message that we carry. This is something that is unique to our church. It's not found in other churches. It's already a sign that God really gave us that light. So we will be able to share wisdom and, um, you know, bring souls to Jesus through through the health message. There are a lot of people that are thirsting for Christ and for salvation, and there are a lot of people that are sick and that need healing and need Christ and need to know about proper diet and healthful living. So that's one way to, to you know, do God's work and, um, and be adventurous there. So I can only encourage you to do that. But start with your own bodies. Be knowledgeable. Research. Find out, like, you can start with, like, the top 10 most dangerous foods. Like, just Google it. Everything's on Google. Um, make the effort to be knowledgeable and equipped with wisdom, and God will surely guide you. So um, for those who have more questions or have maybe things you'd like to share with me that I can add to uh, this message, let's keep in touch. Um, I'm on Facebook. I have um, a public page as well, so I, I read and reply to everyone, um, you know, in as much as possible, a timely manner. It's Sister Sandra Seifert. So um, I, I hope and pray that we can all stay in touch. And if we don't see each other again in LA, as I always say, I pray with all my heart that we all make it to heaven. So that's it for today. And again, uh, happy Sabbath, and thank you so much for your time and attention. May God bless you all, us all. <laughs>